I think this diagram explains quite well what's happening in protein kinase C activation, but to put it into words, we start with a ligand, it binds to the G protein coupled receptor. This is only true of the particular isoform that we're talking about in this case, which is um, phospholipase C beta, but you need to make sure that uh, it is in fact an isoform that is dealing with G protein coupled receptor rather than something like a receptor tyrosine kinase. So in this case though, we are dealing with a G protein coupled receptor. Once we have um, recycling of the GDP in, back into GTP, we have activation of the alpha subunit, it dissociates from the beta gamma subunits and then associates itself with the phospholipase C and it's going to activate it. This will allow for cleavage of PIP2 or a phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate, I think that's what that is, to become diacylglycerol which associates within the plasma membrane and we have the release of IP3, which then diffuses into the cytosol, where it will act on the sarcoplasmic reticulum channels known as IP3-gated um, calcium channels, and this will allow for the efflux of calcium, which will increase the intracellular calcium concentration. This will then bind to calmodulin, forming a calcium-calmodulin complex. This will activate myosin light chain kinase, which will phosphorylate our myosin light chain and ultimately results in smooth muscle contraction. Then what we have is with our diacylglycerol, we, we know that um, uh, for the um, for one isoform of protein kinase C, the conventional isoform, we have activation being done by diacylglycerol, phosphatidylserine, and also this calcium that we now have within the cells, increased calcium concentration. This will activate protein kinase C, and as all kinases do, it will phosphorylate various different things, and this can have uh, a multitude of different effects depending on what it phosphorylates.